Well, hello there, and welcome back to Thomas Frank Explains. So Notion just launched a brand new formulas language they're calling Formulas 2.0. It is massively more powerful than the original formulas language. And in this video, we are gonna dive kind of into the deep end, and I'm gonna show you how to build something that was completely impossible with Formulas 1.0, and also something that I actually got a lot of requests for. So I'm very excited that we can build this now. So let's jump in and I'm gonna show you what we're gonna build. And then this is gonna be kind of a nice introduction and kind of a crash course into how to use some of the more advanced functions of Formulas 2.0. So here I've got my own copy of Creator's Companion, which is uh, my Notion template for managing my YouTube and blog content. And I've got a nice little YouTube tab now that shows me the top three videos for each of my YouTube channels with their view counts. I also have a link directly to the Notion page for that project. And I can even click the link and go right to the video on YouTube itself. So this is what we're gonna be building today. But before we start, I wanna show you one other example because the code behind this formula, which looks complex now, but don't you worry, we are gonna go very, very step-by-step -step through it, is actually quite applicable to other use cases. Uh, for example, here, I've got a stores database here. And then for each of these stores, I have my sales by the day of the week. So now I can tell that Quality Comics has is making on average uh, 3,300 bucks on Mondays to make in 4,700 bucks on Thursdays. And that is pulling from a sales database where I have individual sale records per store from Gus's games and wavetable synths, all these cool made up store names. And now we can basically roll up that information in a highly customized way. So we're gonna start building this and we're gonna go step by step through the entire process. My goal here is to give you sort of an introduction to some of these more advanced functions, hopefully help you to conceptually understand them so you can apply them in your own way and then show you how to build this from scratch. If you are a creator, you're gonna be able to add this to your own Notion templates for your YouTube videos. If you are using Creators Companion, you could add it into that. I'll probably ship it in an update in the near future. Uh, but for now, we're going to build it from scratch. So here I have a little bit of a test area where I've got some YouTube videos. I pulled in their views. I've got their URLs and everything. And we're just going to build this formula right down here in this channel area. So once again, for this channel, which you can see all of these videos are related to via a relation property, we want to get the top three videos. And then we want to show those view counts, the title of the video. We want to link to the YouTube video itself and also be able to link to the uh, Notion page in case we want to go check the script or the BRL list or something like that. So we're going to start by simply opening up this brand new formula editor here. And you can see it looks pretty much like the old one, but there are a lot more functions. And uh, the biggest update in my mind is we now have what are called list functions. So we can kind of see here that we have functions like match. We have functions like if I go down a little bit more, I should be able to find the other ones slice concat. Essentially, if I create what's called a list or in programming this would often be called an array we can now work with individual uh, list values so here I've just got one two three four five I am enclosing those in brackets to kind of show that they are lists and now you can see we've actually outputted a list here this is super powerful and way way more powerful than what we had in formulas 1.0 because we can now do operations on these list values so for example if I just call sort on here I'm gonna get well it's sorted, but if I were to say change the order to say one, uh, three, and one, how about one, two, now we can see sort is sorting that list numerically. If I then were to do uh, reverse on it, so let's do sort and then do reverse, now we're gonna get it in reverse order from highest to lowest. And you can see that we now also have what's called this method chaining syntax, where we can kind of call these functions uh, by using the dot operator here and then calling the function on the thing we're working on, in this case, a list. And we can kind of do that as many times as we want. So essentially what we're building is sort of like a pipeline here, a multi-stage pipeline, where we have an object or a list or a piece of data we're working on. We are gonna pipe that into this function. That's going to return something that then gets piped into the next function that is chained onto it. And we can create this whole chain of methods that return basically whatever we want. And if you ever get into programming or coding, I've got a whole tutorial on how to work with the Notion API with JavaScript code. If you're curious, you're going to recognize a lot of similarities between programming code and this. So working with Notion formulas, as I've learned, is actually a great way to start learning how to code uh, for real. And to make this a little bit more clear, I wanna go over to a little presentation that I put together in uh, Whimsical. You can find this tool over at whimsical.com, but I essentially want to kind of give you a visual example of what a list actually 
actually is. So a list is what's called a data structure, and it basically has a number of elements in a specific order, and each of those elements has what's called an index. Uh, usually they start from zero, we call that zero-based indexing. So here we have zero, one, two, three, four, five, uh, actually just through four, but we have five elements. And you can see we have some Pokemon here, and they are kind of unsorted. They are in an order, but they're not really sorted. If I were to say call a method like sort on it, then I'm going to get a new list but now it's in sorted order. You can see now we have our Pokemon in alphabetical order. So that's basically what list methods actually do. They take in a list as the input, and then they return a new list uh, that is basically the same, but it's now sorted. If we are working with string values, basically text, then they're gonna be sorted in alphabetical order. If we're working with numbers like we had before, they'd be sorted in numerical order and so on. So with that out of the way, how do we actually start getting our uh, sorted list of videos by their views? Well, to do that, what we need to actually do is instead of having a list of numbers, we need to get into the relation property that uh, basically has all those related video pages that are related to this channel. So to do that, we can simply find our relation property, which is called videos, and now you can see it is outputting a list of all those videos. In fact, if I hit done here, this looks a lot like the relation property itself. It's just outputting a list of the pages in that property, all the pages that are related to this channel. You can see once again, all these are related to that channel. That's why we're seeing them there. And if I click on them, I can even get into them, which is pretty nice. And going back into the editor, I can do the same exact thing that I did with our list of numbers. I could call sort on this, and it's gonna sort it in alphabetical order. I could reverse that if I wanted to reverse alphabetical order. But what we really wanna do is sort by the view counts. So what we actually want to do is instead of just working on what are essentially the titles of each of these pages, we need to figure out how we can get in to those pages and access the properties of them. So the way that we can do that in Formulas 2.0 is with a method called map. And before I show you what map does here in the Notion formula editor, I wanna go through it in my presentation because it is a method that takes a little bit of time to fully understand. But what map essentially does is it takes an input list just like the sort method, and then it is going to run some kind of operation that you define on every single element in the list and then it's going to return a brand new list that is uh, basically defined by all these elements running through your function. So here we've got a very simple example of one. I've got a starter list of input Pokemon. Every single one of them is going to go through my map function, and the actual function that I have uh, basically set up inside of map is what I'm gonna call evolve. So basically it's going to go down the list. Charmander is gonna go in there. It's gonna be returned as Charmeleon. Uh, Squirtle is now gonna come in there. It's gonna be returned as Wartortle and then finally Bulbasaur will go into our function and be evolved into Ivasaur. So inside of Notion Formulas, the way that we can reference the current item of the list that we're working on is by using the current keyword. And you can see here, now it looks basically exactly like it did before when I just referenced the videos token here. I've got this list here, but now that I am operating on a specific page in the relation instead of just the entire list itself, I can chain a dot onto current and I can access the properties of the pages in that relation. And this is what's so powerful about Formulas 2.0. There's a lot of other functions, but this is huge. So uh, it's basically like rollups, but now we can do a lot more with them. And if I just add views onto the end, now you can see I have a list being outputted of all the view counts from my video's relation. Going back, just to make sure this makes total sense here, again, we are accessing each element in this list and we're running a specific uh, function on it. In this case, it's evolved to get some evolved Pokemon. In Notion's case, what we're doing is accessing every video or every related row in our relation property called videos. And for each one, we are accessing the view count of that page. And then we're building a brand new list with all those view counts. And it's gonna give us uh, the list ordered by default in the insertion order, uh, basically the order in which these pages were created up here. So if we want to get these view counts sorted, we can do the exact same thing we did before with that really basic list of numbers. We can call sort, and now we're gonna get our view counts in ascending order, and then we can chain reverse onto the end, and now we get it in our descending order. So now we kind of have our view counts, and they are sorted in this descending order, uh, and that is getting us very close to getting those top three view counts. So here's what happens if I hit done. I just have a list of those view counts, but if I come back in here, and now I call the slice method, 
uh, I will be able to just get the top three. So if I go slice, we'll go zero and three, and I'll explain this in just a second. Now I have only the top three. And basically what this function is doing is it's returning the items of a list from a start index, basically what position do we wanna start at, and that is included, and then to an end index, which is exclusive, which means the end index is not going to be included here. So by passing zero as the index and three as the end index, let's go back to our presentation here just to sort of look at how this would work. We are going to be including the uh, zero number index uh, item here, one and two, and then we are excluding our end index. So if we were operating on this list, we would get Charmander, Squirtle, and Bulbasaur, and that'd be it. We're slicing this array to get a new array. And when I say array, I basically mean list. Array is how we talk about lists in programming. So going back to Notion, that is how we get our top view counts. So now the question becomes, how do we get from here, just showing view counts, to something like this where we have all of this detail here. And the answer is that we're gonna take these view counts and we're gonna essentially search back through this relation to find the rows that match these view counts. This is essentially how we have to do this kind of operation here because at least right now in Formulas 2.0, the sort method is as it is. You can't really pass any criteria in there. It just sorts by whatever you have. So it's gonna be alphabetical if you're working with string values. It's gonna be numerical sort if you're working with number values, but what we can do is basically get this list and then use it to sort of search through our database to find the matching records. And the way we're gonna do that is once again by using this map function. Now, instead of mapping through that list of all these video titles, we're gonna map through this resulting list and we are going to do something to each one of these values. So let's do that by calling map one more time. And here I'll show you another huge quality of life improvement in Formulas 2.0. If I use shift enter, I can actually go to a new line. And in fact, I can indent, uh, I can even add comments. So if I did slash and I believe it's asterisk, I could add a comment and then uh, close it with asterisk and slash. So you can actually comment your formulas if they get really long and really complex. If you wanna add reminders for yourself, you can do that. Uh, but for now, I'm just gonna go on to a new line and we are going to start figuring out how we can map through this list and search through our database using each of its values. So once again, I could use that current keyword and you can see here, I have uh, the exact same list as I did before because I'm just referencing the current value inside of my map function. That's basically not a huge improvement. What I wanna do is now I wanna take say 700, uh, 704,883 and I wanna search back through this database to try to find the record where the views actually match that number. Number. And the way that we need to do that, I'm just going <clears> to, <throat> is to try to find the views that match that number. And the way that we need to do that is by using another function called find. And find is yet another function that is going to operate on a list. So I won't actually be able to call it on current because current, as we can see here, again, represents the current item in the list we're operating on through map. Current is just a number. So let me go ahead and delete this just for a second, just so I can bring up the find function and show you what it does. It says here, returns the first element in the list, the list that we're gonna be operating on with the find function, for which the condition returns true. And in this case, the condition that we want to compare against is does the view count of a row in this database match, again, the current view count that we are working on here with this current keyword. So instead of referencing current here, what I actually wanna do is get back into our videos relation. And from there, I can call that find method. Now you can see it actually comes up because it knows we're working on a list again. And I can call that, but we are going to run into a slight problem here. Find also has its own current keyword. And you can see if I'm referencing current here, current is outputting all of the pages in that video's relation because it is referencing the find method. But you might be spotting a problem here. We needed to map through our list of view counts and for each one compare it against the records in our uh, video's relation. But now current is not referring to our view counts. So how do we access that? Well, that brings us to another huge quality of life and power level improvement in Formulas 2.0, and that's variables. Uh, this is something that I have been wanting for literal years. Now we have what's called the let function. And let 
essentially lets us define a variable, give it a value, and then use that variable in other parts of our formula instead of having to uh, write tons and tons of the same repeated code over and over again. So the way I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna give it a name. So the first argument in let is a name. Let me see if I can find the, the reference here. Yep, here it is. So uh, assigns a value to a variable and evaluates the expression using that variable. So right here, we can see exactly what's happening. Uh, the first argument in let is gonna be the name that we want the variable to have. The second argument is gonna be whatever the value of that variable is. And you can see here, they are just giving it a simple string value, but this could be a full calculation all on its own if you wanted to, or in our case, it's gonna be current. So let's use that let function right here. Let's give it a name. I'm gonna use current count as the name. Uh, the value is going to be current, so shift enter current. And now this current refers to the map function again. So its value is going to be uh, whatever the view count is. And we can actually see that if we just pass current count as the expression here, once again, this looks exactly the same. We have those view counts and that means instead of just referencing current count here, we can once again, get into our videos relation. We can call that find method once again, but now we can actually reference the current value of this video's relation inside of find and compare it against the view count that is stored in current count. So the way we would do that is once again, we're gonna use that current keyword. And uh, let me go ahead and actually put this on its own line just to make things a bit more clear. So I'm gonna uh, shift enter down a couple of times just to do some nice fancy formatting. And we're gonna do current dot again we can get into the properties of the current page we're working on in this relation so we're going to grab the views once again uh, and now we're going to compare it against the current count so if i just hit done now you can see we have our top three videos and if i go back up here and we once again sort by a uh, view count and it might already be sorted but i'm just going to add this just as a reminder of how to sort things uh a video for anyone feeling behind in life has 704,000 views, 10 best Windows productivity apps, and so on. So 700, 627, 583. Uh, and let's see, how to break your phone addiction. Was that the third one? Yes, it was. So there we have our top three videos sorted uh, by their views. And if that's all that you wanted, then you are done. You could add this to your Notion workspace. But if you wanted to get a little bit fancier and add the view counts, add the titles here with the links to the actual YouTube videos, then uh, you will want to keep following along because we are now going to modify this formula a little bit to get something a bit more useful. So essentially what we have done here is we've returned just the page reference uh, for each instance of this map function right here. But instead of just getting the page reference, we wanna get, again, that page title, the URL, we wanna get the view count, we wanna get the uh, Notion ID so we can actually link to the page. We wanna get a lot more stuff than just this page reference. So instead of just having one variable here, we can actually change the let function to let's, which actually will let us define multiple variables instead of just one. This is super powerful. So if we hover over let's here, we can see it looks very similar to the original let function, except we now just have a repetition of this variable value pair here, and we can do that as many times as we want. So here in the example, they are assigning a value of hello to A, a value of world to B, and then the final argument of the uh, the function call here is A plus a space character plus B, and that gets us hello world. So what we wanna do is basically take what we have here and store it in another variable. So I'm just gonna go right up here by current. I'm gonna enter down, I'm gonna give us another variable name, we'll just call it video. Uh, and now the value of this is going to be stored in this video uh, keyword here. And once again, we can prove that by passing just video as our uh, final expression in the let's function, and there we have it. But I could go into that video keyword and get the views, or I could get the name, or I could get the URL, and now we have a sorted list. These are our top three videos. Once again, because we already know which values we're mapping through by their view counts, but now I actually have their URLs. So all we need to do at this point is 
kind of string multiple values together to get something that looks a little bit more like this. So the way that we can do that is by using what's called string concatenation, basically taking multiple text values and mashing them together. Uh, and that's how we're gonna build basically this little fancy thing right here. So I'm going to, instead of calling video.url, I'm gonna call video.name. And then if I do the plus operator, I could add say a space, and then I could plus and add video dot uh, views. And just like that, you can see we have our video titles, we have our view counts, and it's all still sorted in the correct order and we're still getting the top three. To make this look a little bit better, the next thing we can do is add a bit of styling. So once again, I'm going to go ahead and use shift enter to put all this stuff on its own new line. And I think I'll actually just let the space character kind of hang out there, but this I wanna put down here just so everything looks a bit more uh, readable and easy to work with. And uh, basically on anything you want, you can call this new style function. And style, let's see if I can find it in the reference guide here. Uh, for whatever reason, it's not coming up. So I'll just show you. Style can take a lot of different, oh, here it is, a lot of different arguments. You could pass B for bold, U for underline. We have colors for the text and colors for the background as well. So for the view counts, I think what I wanna do is first uh, give it code styling because that kind of gives it this nice little uh, rounded text box. I want to have the text be green. And then I think I also wanna have the background be green as well. And then I think I want the entire thing to be bold as well. So instead of passing the B argument in this style call, which is only affecting the video views, I'm gonna come onto the very end of my entire chain and I'm gonna add style uh, B and that's gonna bold the entire thing. So now we're getting something that looks a little bit closer to our final product here. What we need to do to make this totally perfect is truncate the titles here because right now we can see those titles are pretty long. And even if we stretch things out, uh, number one, we need to make sure they go on their own new lines, but sometimes you might have a really long video title and it might make things look really unorganized. So we wanna truncate those video titles to get our view counts sort of in the same place vertically. We wanna add a little page icon that actually links to the Notion page. Uh, we want to link to the YouTube video. And then what might be one of the more technical parts, so I'm gonna save this for the end, we wanna get commas in our numbers here. And that's a little harder than you might think it is, but stick with me and you are going to understand exactly how to do it. So first and foremost, let's go ahead and get our YouTube video links and then our Notion page links because that's actually pretty easy to do. So if I go back into our formula here, you can see we have video.name and uh, a new function that I'm gonna introduce you to is the link function. So within link, you can basically just pass a hyperlink to anywhere and that's gonna get you a nice handy dandy clickable link. So we already have the video's URL per video in this database here. We're already accessing all this database data via the page relations. So maybe think about this in your head for a second, but all we have to do is call that video.url property. So once again, I'm gonna enter down just to make this as easy and clear as possible. If we do video.url, we're accessing that URL property and now we can see that these are clickable. If I click on this video here, I get that video on my YouTube channel with me looking all pensive and stuff. So going back over here, uh, next I think I want to get our, our little video references on their own lines because right now it's just one kind of unbroken line and we've got commas here, we don't want those. So the next thing we wanna do is come down to the very end and remember that even though this is kind of looking really tall, all of this is happening within this specific map function call. Uh, it starts here at this parenthesis mark and it ends here at this one. So everything is happening inside of map and then the new list that map is returning, we are then passing into style. Well, one additional thing we can pass it into is this join function. So join essentially will take a list of values and turn that entire list into a single string and then you can pass a separator. So if we passed a comma and a space as a separator, then we'd get a string where every element is separated by a comma and a space. I'm actually going to pass uh, backslash n. So backslash n, that is the character for a new line. And if I hit done here, I apparently broke something. And actually the reason that I broke something is that style already coerces our list to a string. So instead of putting it at the end here, I actually wanna put it before style. So I'm gonna go dot join and I'm going to pass my uh, backslash n right there. And now when I enter out of here, 
we are going to have every one of these videos on its own new line. Now, if I don't have my property uh, wrapping here, then it's gonna just do that, which is not very good. But if I choose wrap column on this property, then every element is gonna be on its own line. And again, this is now a single string value, but because we ran it through that joiner function with a new line, every single one appears to be on its own new line and appears to be a separate thing. And from a usability perspective, it basically is. So the next thing we wanna do is get that little page page icon that links to the Notion project. Uh, and this requires a little bit of setup. So I'm gonna show you what I did up here in the videos database first. Uh, this is really easy. If I go into any one of these videos, you can see that I have a formula property called ID. If I click into this, all I am passing is a function called ID, which just returns the page ID for this particular page. And uh, this wasn't documented when I was trying things out, but I figured out that if you just link to the page ID, you get a clickable link to the Notion page. So all we need to do is add a little bit more string concatenation. So let's find the end of that uh, video views thing here. Let's pass another space character just to get some separation. And then I'm gonna shift enter down onto another new line and I'm going to do uh, a page character. So I'll do, I think it's control command space. Yes, it is. Uh, I'm gonna find that page character right there to get an emoji. And then we can call dot link on this particular string value. So between these two quote symbols is a piece of data just called a string. This is an individual string, so we can pass link on it. And uh, inside of link, we can do video once again, which again refers to the current page we're working on in that video's relation. And we can go ID, that is a property. And now we have a clickable little page link. If I click that, we now get a video for anyone feeling behind in life. So this I just think is super useful because let's just say you're on the dashboard of Creators Companion and you're looking at your top three videos. Uh, you have a super quick way to get to the video itself or you can get to the uh, actual Notion page where you might have your script, you might have B-roll, you might have comments, all kinds of good stuff. Okay, what's next on the docket here? We don't have our titles being truncated yet, so let's now add that in. Uh, and this is going to be the first taste that a lot of you have probably ever had of regular expressions, which is basically a intimidating looking, but kind of simple when you really break it down, uh, language all its own for manipulating text. Um, I had to learn regular expressions like a freaking ninja because in formulas 1.0, we didn't have lists, we didn't have arrays, we didn't have a lot of these new fancy functions. So I had to get very creative with regular expressions to do a lot of the cool stuff you've seen in my templates. Well, we can still use those for some more limited purposes here in formulas 2.0. So by clicking into our formula, we are now going to try to truncate these titles so they're all more or less the same length. And we can do that with a function called replace. So let's go to video.name. And one thing that uh, you might run into, which I already know, is that if you try to call the replace function or any kind of string manipulation function after your link function here, it's gonna strip that link out because it's gonna take in uh, text that might be a hyperlink, but it's gonna return just text. So I want to uh, do our replace call before our link call. So I'm gonna add link down here on its own line uh, and I'm going to add replace first. And let's take a quick look at what replace actually does. So it says it replaces the first match of the regular expression, and I'll explain what that means in a second, with the replacement value. And we have a nice little example down here. We have the string notion, notion. And then in the replace, our first argument is what's called a regular expression. Basically, it's an expression that describes what kind of text we're looking for. In this case, it is just a capital N. And the first one it finds, which will be this character here, is gonna be replaced with an M. So now we get motion notion. And that doesn't seem super powerful until you realize that regular expressions is a whole language with a ton of special tools for describing uh, varied types of text that you could access. And you're gonna see that in just a second here. So inside of my replace call here, I'm gonna, again, shift enter down and put our arguments on their own lines. And I'm just gonna do blank string, blank string. So right now, nothing is happening because we are matching nothing and replacing it with nothing. Uh, if I did, let's just say the capital A, then we could replace that with capital B. And now we get B video for anyone feeling behind in life, but we wanna get a bit fancier with it. Again, we're trying to truncate these titles so they're all about the same length. So what we can do is actually put 
uh, parentheses characters in our regular expression, and this creates what's called a capture group. So basically, you could match against an entire expression, and within that expression, you're going to have a group of characters you capture, which you can then reference later on. So what I wanna do is inside this capture group, try to get, say, the first 25 characters of the title, no matter what they are. And the way I can do that is by using the period character. The period character basically says this should match any character. The only character the period won't match is a new line. Now, if you wanted to match against an actual period, you could put a backslash there. That does what's called escaping. It escapes this special character here and tells the engine that, hey, we want to actually uh, match against a period character, not that special uh, little wildcard there. But I actually want it to be a wildcard there. And then we can use something called a quantifier. So right now, it's just going to match a single uh, of any character really, but if we add a couple of curly braces and we put say 25 in there, then it's going to match up to 25 characters. So we're starting to get a bit of truncation here, but remember we are capturing the first 25 characters and then we want to actually replace everything else with just that first 25 characters. So after the capture group, I'm gonna add another period in there, and then I'm going to add the uh, asterisk quantifier. And the asterisk quantifier basically says uh, zero or more of whatever is before it. So period is any character, and asterisk is let's match zero or more of them up until we can't match anymore. Uh, so if I go in here, instead of putting B, I can actually put dollar sign one, and with capture groups, basically, whenever you build a capture group in a regular expression, it's going to be assigned a value or a variable, really, of dollar sign and then the number of whichever capture group it is. So if I had multiple capture groups in this regular expression, I might have dollar sign one, two, three, etc. In this case, I just have one, so dollar sign one does it. And then if we wanted to, we could do like a dot, dot, dot after it to sort of show that truncation. Uh, and this now makes the title exactly the same length every single time. Uh, there are some characters here that are different widths, but just to show you what we could do here, if we then uh, ran this through another style call, so let's just do style and we uh, pass C as the argument, that's going to style it as code and code fonts are what are called monospaced. Every single character takes the exact same amount of horizontal space. So if we hit done here, they should be all the exact same length. And if that's what you wanted, if you wanted to look almost like a table here, then you could do that. Uh, what I want though, is for my words to not be cut off here. So we've got feeling, we have pradu, we have ah. And over here, you can see that we actually end the truncation on an actual word barrier. So we're not slicing words in half. And we need a little bit of extra trickery in our regular expression to achieve that. So let's go back down to our replace call. You can see here, we are matching 25 of any character. So what we wanna do is add a little bit on the end of that to make sure that we're matching any word characters up until the next space or piece of punctuation. And there is, in fact, a little wild card for just word characters, so alphanumerics like A through Z and 0 through 9, and that is slash or backslash W. So now we are getting, uh, in this case, just one of them because we haven't added a quantifier. But if I add, I think, plus onto the end, now we get... Uh, feeling, we get productivity, we get phone addiction, we're good to go there. Plus is very much like the asterisk, except for it means one or more instead of zero or more. So if there were zero of these, it wouldn't match at all. Um, but if there's one or more, it's going to match up until it can't match anymore. So the truncation is done. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of that styling. So it's not code styling anymore. And now it is starting to look almost like our final result here. The only thing we need to do to finish this up is to get the commas in the numbers. And I've already introduced you to a little bit of working with regular expressions, so it probably isn't gonna surprise you to know that we have to once again break out the regular expressions to add our commas in here. Uh, the reason for that is when we're getting our views here, 
it's not actually a number. And uh, what I have found is with formulas, even if you are formatting a number property with a comma here, and pro tip, you can do that by just going to edit property on a number property, and then the number format can be changed to number with commas. But even if we're doing that, the formula that actually references those numbers isn't necessarily going to add those commas in there. Uh, if a formula is returning just one number, then you can go ahead and add that formatting just as you would with a number property. But in this case, we are returning a lot of text. We are returning an emoji here. So this number is going to be coerced to a string value. Basically, it's still gonna look like a number, but it's type is no longer a number. We could no longer do arithmetic on it. It is just text using numeric characters. And that means there's no built-in logic that is gonna add those commas, meaning we have to add them ourselves. So let's go ahead and do that. And once you do this, you are gonna be well on your way to being a regular expressions master. Uh, that old guy who works at your company who's been like in the basement running Linux systems for 50 years is gonna respect you finally. So let's go find our views here. We've styled them uh, just like before, just to keep things kind of nice and organized, I'm going to move our style call down and I'm gonna call our replace call first. So I'm gonna do dot replace one more time. And we're gonna to have to use replace twice here for reasons that will become clear in just a second. So again, keeping things nice and tidy on their own lines. You can keep things way more compact if you want to. I'm just putting everything on its own new line for this video's clarity's sake. Uh, so what we wanna do this time is try to figure out where in this string we need to place a comma. And because numbers actually start counting from the right side, like this is the ones place, this is the tens place, and so on, we need to actually make our regular expression look from the end of the string, from the right side, to make its match. That way it knows to count from the right side, one, two, three, oh, there's my thousands place, let's insert a comma. So to do that, there's actually a special character that you can put at the end of your regular expression, uh, the dollar sign. And earlier, we were able to use a dollar sign here to reference capture groups, but dollar signs are double duty. And if they are at the very end of a regular expression uh, itself, then that basically tells the engine, hey, start looking from the end of the string instead of the beginning, or at least make sure the match goes to the end of the string. It cannot be a match in the middle. It has to go to the very end. So now that we are basically ensuring we go to the end, we can look for three instances of a numeric character. And earlier we used this uh, backslash W wildcard, which represents any alphanumeric. So again, A through Z and zero through nine. There is yet another wildcard, which is backslash D, that is going to find any numeric character. So you can see we just replaced uh, the final number in these view counts with nothing. If I put in an emoji instead, we now have uh, 704 and whatever that is. So that is essentially what we can do, but we need to capture the first three so we can get the ones, tens, and hundreds place and then put a comma before it. So just like we did before, let's use our curly braces to define a specific number of characters that we want to match up to, which is going to be curly brace three. And now you can see we are adding our little uh, smiley emoji, laughing emoji, uh, <laughs> instead of these characters. But again, if we were to reference a capture group, which we actually have to build first, so let's wrap this in parentheses, we could then reference our capture group with dollar sign one. And now you can see we have an emoji in between our uh, thousands place and our hundreds place, just where a comma should be. So all we need to do is replace that emoji with a comma, and now we have ourselves a nice comma, but there's a problem here. It's only going to work for videos that are between a million and a thousand views, and I can't really show it to you very easily because we're kind of sorting by the top here, but if you imagine we only had like 900 views on a video, we're just gonna have a comma there and no thousands place. Uh, and similarly, if we have a video over 1 million views, I can show you that problem by just changing one of these views to a uh, million and 700,000. We are not going to have a comma there because we're only matching the first three characters from the end of the string, which is why we need another replace call so we can add a comma in our millions place. So once again, we're gonna do dot replace, and it's gonna be very similar to what we just did, but we're gonna have a slight tweak so we can account for the comma that we already added. So just like before, we're gonna match from the end of the string that we're looking through. Uh, just like before, we're gonna create a capture group, but this time we are going to get our slash D 
and three. That's gonna match the first three. We also wanna match the comma we added and the next three. So the way we can do that is add that comma in there and then do the exact same thing one more time. So to go through this, this first little group of uh, slash D, any numeric character for three, is capturing the hundreds, tens, and ones place. Then we're capturing the comma. Then we're capturing the hundred thousands, ten thousands, and thousands place in this next little group, all binding into the capture group that we have here. And now you can see, because we are replacing everything with nothing, we just get that one for the one million view video, and that's it. If we come here and we actually just pass, say, a comma, and then our uh, dollar sign one, we get a comma just like that. Now there is a little bit of additional robustness we can add in here, and I'm going to actually change the formula up just a little bit to show you why. I'm gonna get rid of this reverse right here, and that's gonna give us our lowest counted videos by default. And you can see here, we actually have a comma before our first number, and that's not really good. Uh, in fact, if I were to make one of these videos really, really low, let's go with 883 views, not even a thousand, we're also gonna have the same problem in the uh, thousands place here. So what we need to do is make a little bit of a tweak to our regular expressions to account for the fact that there might not be a number in the thousands place or in the millions place. And the way we can do that is by defining additional matching criteria inside of our regular expression. So here, I'm just gonna add one additional capture group. I'm going to do the slash D once again, but this time I'm gonna use the plus operator. This is gonna specify that the match needs to find one additional number there. Otherwise, uh, this is basically going to be ignored. Again, we're starting from the end here. So if it does find something, it's gonna be included in the entire match. If it doesn't find anything, it's not gonna be included at all. So we can actually now reference dollar sign one on this side of the comma and change this to dollar sign two, which is referencing the second capture group we made. And now you can see we have fixed the problem for this video that has less than a thousand views. Now all we need to do is do the exact same thing over on our second call. So we'll make another capture group slash D plus, ensuring that if there is a million view video, we are gonna get that millions place. But if there's not, then we are only gonna be capturing um, the first six digits and there will be no comma inserted. So again, we're gonna change this over to dollar sign one, dollar sign two, and now that is totally fixed. If I uh, once again go back in here and add our reverse call one more time, then of course we get our videos in their uh, proper view order. And if we change this one, uh, it's down here now, to let's just say 1.700 million again, we will get at the top and the commas are in place correctly. So comparing against our final product, we have our link, it links to the YouTube video, we've already tested that. We have our view counts with their commas, we have our page icon, links to the Notion page. That all looks good, does that work? Yes it does. We have built this formula and hopefully if you've paid attention, you now have the skills to build something like this yourself. And I'll just go ahead and show the formula for this sales by day of week on screen here. We're not gonna walk through this one quite in the same way, um, but it's using a lot of the same exact ideas and principles here. We're basically defining a list of sort criteria. In this case, we're actually using the numbers that correspond to specific days of the week. Again, we're mapping through that. We're binding the current value of map in a variable here. We're creating a sales variable. Uh, this time we're actually filtering through to get the uh, current day of each sale. And then we're doing some fancy math here and some fancy formatting to get the uh, total dollar amount of sales that are on each day of the week and then formatting it in a nice way. And I would urge you to study this if you wanna learn formulas deeply and look through each of these functions and look at what they do because the more of these tools that you're familiar with, the more you're going to be able to employ, combine, mix and match to solve any kind of problem you run across. And uh, it's at this point that I wanna let you guys know that over on thomasjfrank.com, we have a complete Notion formula reference and Ben Smith on my team has been working like crazy over the past couple of weeks to completely transfer this from formulas 1.0 to formulas 2.0. It is live today. 
So if you go over to thomasjfrank.com slash formulas, or if you're just anywhere on my site, you can go to the learn notion menu in the top up here and you can go to notion formulas. You're going to find a complete formulas tutorial. We have articles going over all the parts of what formulas do. We also have, uh, individual articles for every single piece of notion formulas. Every single one of them is going to have a page that shows you how to use it. It's going to have little tool tips and good to knows. It's going to have examples, example databases, and we'll be building this out and making it comprehensive in the coming weeks. So definitely bookmark this as a resource if you do want to get more confident and uh, capable with Notion formulas. Last thing I'll mention here, because we were building a formula that is really useful inside of Creators Companion, shows all these top three view counts. If you are a serious content creator, and especially if you're running multiple channels like I am, or you've got a blog, YouTube channel, social media presence, then you might like Creators Companion. This is the Notion template that I built for myself and my team to completely manage our entire content production pipeline. We have all of our content ideas in there. We write scripts in there. We have research in there. We also manage the entire editing process. And then this one's really exciting actually. I just built this for myself the other day. I now have an automation that will bring in accurate view, uh, comment and like counts. It will bring in the thumbnails and the actual publish dates with their time from the YouTube API. So now inside of my own copy of Creators Companion, I have all this up-to-date data automatically set for all of the YouTube videos that I published across all of my channels. And then I think there's gonna be some really cool analysis stuff we can do with this in the future. So uh, I've already built this automation. I'm gonna be shipping it to people who have bought Creators Companion. It may be a paid upgrade in the future, but at least for now, I'm gonna be giving it out for a limited time. Uh, so if you want to try out Creators Companion, again, if you are a serious content creator, thomasjfrank.com slash CC is the URL you can go to. And right now you can also use the code let's go 2023 to get 50 bucks off of any edition of Creators Companion. Once again, thank you for watching. Hopefully this was a, a little bit of a good introduction to Formulas 2.0. Again, that formula reference is going to have articles for all the functions. I've got another video coming out very soon. that's going to go over a lot of the new features in formulas in a much more compact way. So keep your eyes peeled for that, along with lots of additional tutorials coming down down the pipeline. Since this one was a technical one, I'm also going to link to my Notion API tutorial. If you do want to get a bit more into coding, specifically JavaScript coding, and you want to understand how to actually work with the Notion API, that is your video. It is a two hour long project. You get to build a whole Pokedex in Notion that is generated automatically. Uh, and it is basically like a whole crash course, not only for the Notion API, but kind of for JavaScript as well. So check that out and I will see you in the next one.